Okay, got it all. I have like a little corner with extra notes, so things are all crossed out over there. Anyway, uh, we're going to be in 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 2 this morning. And before we read the passage together, I would like to posit a few questions that help um, orient our thinking about this passage and might help uh, enrich us as we read this morning. Here's the question I'd like to ask all of us. Is it possible to proclaim a belief, yet functionally in the way we live, deny it? Is it possible to say, I believe in fill in the blank, but live in a way that denies that belief? And the answer, I think, is yes. I work as a music teacher at a local school, and I could say that I believe my job is to raise students into free-thinking individuals, but the way I teach could functionally deny that when I tell them what to think rather than how to think. And so in the same way, I think Christians can affirm basic theological truths, but deny them in their lives. I believe that our duty is to study theology deeply so that it changes our lives. In this passage, John is going to give us a test case and, and show us how to do this rightly. He's going to proclaim a theological truth address three false teachings that seem to be permeating this church and respond with what we should do and should proclaim. One theologian makes this same point in his book, The Doctrine of the Knowledge of God. This is John Frame saying, I am seeking to discourage the notion that theology is properly something theoretical, something academic, as opposed to the practical teaching that goes in preaching, counseling, and Christian friendship. Once we see the essential similarity between interpretation and application, we will see that it is arbitrary to restrict the work of theology to the theoretical area or to think that a more theoretical a piece of Christian teaching is, the more theological it is. And then he concludes, theology is the application of God's word to all areas of life. I think that's true, and I think John is going to show us that we must affirm theological truth and let that theological truth change us so that it shows we truly believe. With that, then, let's read 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 2. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Lord, we are in need of your grace this morning. We come maybe distracted, busy, overwhelmed, anxious, depressed, sad, in trials and tribulations and confusion and relational strife. And we need your grace and your gospel this morning. So Lord, I pray that through the preaching of the, your word this morning, that I and all of us would be edified and encouraged, that we would see that scripture does not distinguish between theology and application, and we should not either. Lord, as the word is, is preached, glorify it in the hearts of all who hear. May it enlighten the ignorant, awaken the careless, reclaim the wandering, establish the weak, comfort the feeble-minded, and make ready a people for their Lord. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
So the literary structure in this passage, I think, is pretty clear. If you look at verse 5, we have the main thesis of this passage, God is light. That's the big idea this morning. And then he unpacks that with three hypothetical questions, as if to say, if we affirm that God is light, could we really say this? And these come up in verse 6, in verse um, 8, and in verse 10. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with God, yet walk in darkness, can we do that while also saying God is light? And he works through them one at a time. And then he also responds to them. If you look with me at verse 7, but if we walk in the light, so we have the main theological truth, God is light. And we also have three hypothetical statements, as it were. Could we really say these things and really do these things and yet affirm God is light? And then John masterfully says, this is what you should do. This is what you should be, what you should believe, instead of these false teachings that seem to be plaguing this church at the time. While these questions might seem obvious to us, John is giving us a case study. He's teaching us how to be theological readers of Scripture, but also applicational readers of Scripture. You and I make this distinction in our minds between theological truth and practical life, but the biblical authors don't make that distinction. The doctrine of sanctification teaches us how we grow into the image of Christ. The doctrine of end times is to give us eternal hope now and to give us an eternal perspective to fight against sin and the idols of this world. The doctrine of the church is to give us a community to help us fight our own sin and help others with theirs. And I could go on, but all theology is application, including this passage, the doctrine of God. You see, who God is in himself and what God does in the world is the height of the theological summit, but it is still not divorced from application. And in John's mind, the knowledge of God's moral purity, goodness, and perfection must change your life. And so then this brings us to our main point. God is light. So walk in the light, confess your sins, and trust your advocate. God is light. And so we are to respond by walking in that same light, by confessing our sins, and by trusting our advocate. In each section, John gives us the proper Christian response in light of gospel truths that we hold dear to these false assertions that functionally deny God is light. So with that, let's move to our first main point. God is light. So walk in the light. We'll read verses 5 and 7 together. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. So it, it, it's abundantly clear. The central thesis of this passage is God is light. But what does it mean that God is light? Are we to simply sit back and spend some time thinking, oh, let's look at light. And how is God like that? Well, Scripture actually defines for us the metaphors that it often uses. So throughout the Bible, when it says God is light, it primarily refers to God's holiness. So what we could say in this passage is the main thesis is God is holy. What does it mean to be holy? Well, to say that God is light is to say that God is perfect, holy, and morally pure. But John doesn't stop there, does he? The next phrase emphasizes the fact that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And in, in Greek, there's actually a double negative there to enforce that negation. It could literally be translated, in him there is no darkness, none at all. There's not an inkling of darkness, an inkling of sin, no moral deficiency, and no lack of holiness in God. So he's not just holy. He is most holy. He is the most high God. So in Scripture... Holiness in terms of God, God's holiness, 
has two senses to it, a primary sense and a secondary sense. The first, more primary aspect of God's holiness is God's uniqueness, his transcendence, his self-sufficiency. Isaiah 57, 15 brings this point out very well. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit. So here's what the passage is saying. God's holiness refers to his, him being high and lifted up who is eternal. Throughout history, the theologians have used the term aseity to describe this truth, which literally means that God is of himself. He is independent. He is transcendent. He is utterly unique as creator, distinct from his creation. There is nothing in all creation like him. He is the God who is high and lifted up. He is holy. But scripture also has a secondary sense which flows from the first. Because God is ase, because God is of himself, because God is transcendent, he also is morally perfect. He is pure and righteous. And so in, in that sense, that's what we typically refer to when we talk about the holiness of God. But it must come from him being of himself first. And the reason I make this distinction and bring this point out is because if we don't start with God being ase of himself, then we have to do some philosophical mumbo jumbo to get out of the fact that God's law is in himself. God is goodness in himself. There's no law outside of God that he follows. What God does is holy goodness. That is our great confession and glorious truth, and it takes lifetimes to unpack the holiness of God. And based on how this passage works out, I'd argue that the more we understand the holiness of God, the greater our clarity on it, the more we apply it, the more we are conformed into that same holiness. As we plumb the depths of the holiness of God in both that he is ase, that he's of himself, and that he is morally pure, we are conformed to that moral purity and look more like Jesus. The New Testament authors say the same thing in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. So here... We become transformed to the same image of God's glory as we behold that glory. And in Scripture, glory and holiness are closely related concepts. So it's not that we try and behave harder. It's that we behold God and His holiness and we are transformed into that same image of holiness. So with that, that is the proclamation. That's all that's embedded in what John says simply in three words. God is holy. And then in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, could, we, could a Christian really say that? Could we actually say God is light and then functionally or, or, or even with our own words say, I have fellowship with God if I walk in the darkness? If God is truly holy, that cannot be possible. We could absolutely not say that. No one can have fellowship with God, yet walk in the darkness. If we affirm that, John says we are a liar and do not practice, do not walk in the truth. Now, many of us in this room are Christians. And none of us would outright say, I have fellowship with God and walk in the darkness. But oftentimes we do walk in the darkness. We struggle with many sins and are constantly turning back to our sin. And the call of John in verse 7 is to walk in the light. Don't claim to have fellowship with God and walk in the darkness. Verse 7 says, walk in the light as God is in the light. And then notice what happens. We have fellowship with each other. The result of walking in the light helps us as a church have greater fellowship with each other. And notice the word repetition. 
in verse um, 6, we functionally deny fellowship with God when we walk in the darkness. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with each other, meaning to have fellowship with God. And the greater our fellowship with God, the greater our fellowship with each other. To have true fellowship with God increases and strengthens the fellowship we have with each other in this local assembly. So what does it look like to walk in the light and therefore have fellowship with each other? Well, walking in the light is simply personal holiness. Imagine the rich and glorious fellowship we would have if we simply pursued holiness with the same vigor, with the same passion and zeal that we pursue other things in life. Skills, simple uh, earthly passions. Now, walking in the light and pursuing holiness in this passage is not a private thing. Look what he says. We have fellowship with each other. So your personal holiness is a corporate church project. All of us should be sharpening each other, strengthening each other. This fellowship includes preaching the gospel to each other. Asking about how marriages and parenting are going. Having genuine, honest discussion with each other. To have fellowship with each other means that we are committed to helping our brother and sister sitting next to us in the pew. You are responsible for the, the, the Christian health of others in this church. And they are mutually responsible for you. That's what membership is all about. Church membership is the greenhouse of discipleship. Church membership is how these relationships happen. To have fellowship with each other means that we should be doing the one another's for each other. I'm simply going to read Romans 12, 9 through 21. I want you to consider what this would look like in our church today. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, though, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Imagine if this type of Christian fellowship was characteristic of our church. Imagine if we have genuine love that abhorred evil and cast out evil in each other and encouraged good. Imagine if we loved one another with brotherly affection, familial affection. Imagine if we outdid one another in showing honor. Imagine if we contributed to each other's needs so that no one would have need. Imagine if we showed such rich hospitality that unbelievers got saved. Imagine if we were not arrogant but associated with the lowly among us. Imagine if we were never repaying evil for evil but always responding with good. Imagine if we fed and clothed our enemies. This rich and glorious fellowship is the design for the local church. And so if we're walking in the light, that's what's going to happen. If we say God is light, in him there is no darkness, this is the fellowship that we are called to. But so often we struggle and so often we don't. And John, as a good pastor, says, we have fellowship with one another in verse 7. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we have this cyclical effect where we seek to have this genuine fellowship. We fall short. And that cleansing means to, to, to be cleansed from sin. 
to be made righteous again. And, and so we go back to walking in the light. It's this cyclical pattern where we fall short and God gives grace to cleanse us and restore us back into this fellowship. His shed blood on the cross for our sins is the root, the bedrock for our shared life in Christ together. And when we sin in each other's lives, our initial impulse should be to preach the gospel to each other. I myself need to hear, Christian, if Jesus cleanses you from sin, don't keep turning back to it. If God is light, don't walk in the darkness. Furthermore, is this not the structure of the whole book of Romans itself? Is Romans 11 not the most glorious and high portraits of the gospel? And is Romans 12 not right after Romans 11? The gospel informs and changes our culture as a church in a way that makes it contagious and compelling to an outside world. Be the church. So we saw instead of walking in the darkness, we should walk in the light because God is light. Now let's move to our second main point. God is light, so confess your sins. Confess your sins. This is verse 5, and then we'll read verses 8 and 9 together. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth of God is not in us. But if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we saw the first hypothetical in question in verse 6. Can we say I have fellowship with God and walk in the darkness? Verse 8 presents the second one. If we say we have no sin. Could a Christian say I have no sin, yet affirm that God is light? Absolutely not. This is an act of self-deception, self-swindling, and it reveals the truth is not in us. And I've heard Dave say many times from this pulpit, the thing about self-deception is it's deceiving. The thing about blindness is that we are blind to it. And as I meditated on verse 8, something struck me that each of us, including myself, read past without giving much thought. There's probably very few of you in this room, if any, that would say, I have no sin in my life. If I pulled and asked every one of you, you'd say, yeah, I have some sin. I struggle with sin. But there are times where we don't believe it. Paul Tripp calls this distinction our confessional theology, what we say, and our functional theology, what we do. We, prof tri we profess truths about God, about his holiness, and about his our sinfulness, and more. And we often live as functional atheists where we don't act or believe God is holy and we are sinful. Most of you know my wonderful wife, Hannah. She's a very kind, gracious, and gentle person. And there are times where she confronts me on my sin. My gut reaction is not to respond in a biblical way. The first words of my, out of my mouth are not this, are not this. And I so appreciate the courage of loving honesty and your diligence to my growth in the gospel by seeing things I cannot see in my life. Please pray for me as I change this. That's not my first thought at all, but it should be. Here are my thoughts. She's just being dramatic. She's just being overbearing. She is so blessed to have a husband as wonderful and kind as I am compared to all the other husbands we know. If only she knew how much I sacrificed for her. Now, we all think that's funny, but we all have those thoughts, don't we? We all struggle with those, those thoughts because in, our, in that moment, our gut reaction to confrontation is self-defense. We are self-swindling, self-deceiving, and telling ourselves, I have no sin. In those moments, I, I'm often struck by this glaring contradiction in my own life, in my marriage, in my ministry, to the theology I'm telling you right now and claim to hold so dear. And that's why we need each other. 
That's why we need the church. The preacher of Hebrews says in Hebrews 3, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. How can we stop this long train that's heading straight for hell? Verse 13, exhorts one another. Encourage each other every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In other words, we need the church. We need people to confront and exhort us. We need to confront and exhort others. We talk so often of the daily disciplines of Bible reading, prayer, journaling. But when was the last time you heard about the daily discipline of accountability? I am convinced that the majority of issues in our church and in other churches could be solved simply by the daily discipline of accountability. It keeps me humble when my brothers in Christ tell me my sins. This is awkward, difficult to hear and to tell. But if scripture is true, and it is, it says that we are sinful and self-swindling and self-deceiving to our core. That means we should be the first to admit our need for accountability. Do not deceive yourself into thinking you have no sin in your life and therefore don't need accountability. I would even argue that sin is so pervasive that even the good things we do are tainted by selfishness and sinful desires. So what is the answer to this plight? Yes, we need each other. But we don't need to fear condemnation. Look at what John says in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Instead of saying we have no sin, instead of functionally denying the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's holiness, confess your sin. And he is faithful to forgive. This is not to say that every sin that remains unconfessed is unforgiven. This passage tells us that we have incredible rest in Christ. Any sin that someone could or will confront us on, any sin that we notice in our hearts, any sin we, are, we fear someone would discover is covered, is cleansed, and is forgiven. Even before that sin is confessed or even noticed, it is forgiven for the Christian. We have such a great promise in the gospel. This gospel of grace is the power that fuels us to remain humble, stable, and secure. We have no reason to fear being found out. I have no reason to fear publicly proclaiming my sinful thoughts about my wonderful wife when she confronts me because I believe the gospel. We all struggle with sin together. And we all have the grace of the gospel fueling our confession and confrontation of others because nothing could be exposed about you that hasn't already been covered by the blood of Jesus. And if you are not a Christian here this morning, these promises are not yours. You should fear. And there is condemnation for those that actually say, I don't sin. But the application for you is the same. Confess your sins to your Savior. Confess your need for Christ. And his blood will cleanse you and forgive you. Now before we move on, I wonder if you would, what you would fill in the blank with if we had never read this verse before. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and gracious, kind, merciful. Why does it say that God is just to forgive? Is it right for a judge to forgive someone that's actually guilty? Well, God is just to forgive us because the justice has already been paid. See, Jesus absorbed God's wrath against us for our sin. And therefore, God is just to forgive us because the justice has already been paid. I said an identical thing in first service and a wonderful sister in the faith, Kristen, Lambert came up to me and said, Christian, could it also be that it would be unjust for God to not forgive us because the sins have already been paid? And I said, that is absolutely right. It would be unjust for God to deny us forgiveness because the justice has already been paid. Praise God. 
Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, the wrath we deserved. God is always faithful to his promises, even when we are not. Sin does not ever go unpunished. So with that, we've seen that because God is light, we are to walk in the, in the light as he is in the light. And we are also to confess our sins to each other, knowing that everybody struggles daily with sin and need that daily accountability. And then this brings us to our last point. God is light, so trust your advocate. God is light, so trust your advocate. I'll read verse 5, jump down to verse 10, and go through chapter 2, verse 2. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Chap, uh, verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. And we are still working with the same central thesis statement. God is light. God is holy. And if God is holy and God is good, then could we say that we have never sinned? Absolutely not. If we say that, we make God a liar. Now, some of you might be wondering, what's the difference between verse 8 and verse 10? What's the difference between saying we have no sin versus we have not sinned? The difference relates to some slight nuance with verb tense, but here's what I think is going on. Rather than denying struggles with a particular sin, this passage is saying that we are in an ongoing state of sinless perfection. And just as I said in the last point, we all have sin struggles. But there may be some of us that feel so far ahead in our walk with Christ that we don't need accountability, we don't need each other. We may feel superior and above the church. You may have waltzed into church for the first time in years and feel, well, my church is at home or reading my Bible by a tree in the wilderness. You might be self-deceiving and self-swindling right now with your functional theology saying, I don't need the church, I don't need other people, I don't need anybody else because more or less, I'm in a state of sinlessness. This is functional legalism. And consider these diagnostic questions about your own soul. Do you feel church and other believers as unnecessary to your Christian walk? In fact, it, it hinders your Christian walk. Do you often feel judgment or look down on others because their kids are running around the sanctuary, but yours are perfectly still? Has your focus throughout this sermon been on somebody else and not yourself? Think to yourself, am I someone characterized by bitterness and unforgiveness? These all functionally affirm that you say to yourself in one sense that you are in a state of sinful perfection and are self-righteous. What arrogance do we think we have? What pride do we think we have that we don't need the church and we don't need other people to see things we can't see in our life? I need that. All of us need that. And notice John's response in chapter 2. He says, I am writing these things to you so that not, he doesn't say that he's writing these things so you feel condemned. He doesn't say he's writing these things so you have fear about your salvation. He doesn't say I'm writing these, these things so you may be in a constant state of worry. He does not say I'm writing these things to you so you know I'm better than you. No, John's hope in these words, is to motivate you towards personal holiness. He wants to help you. He wants you to see your need for the church. He wants you to see your need for God. You see, John's theology of holiness is in the right place because it's not just theoretical, it's practical. John uses the doctrine of the church to inform a heresy spreading in the church that changed their lives and tolerated sin. And whatever this false teaching was, it doesn't really matter. It is evident that false teaching causes us to live differently. And whatever your beliefs are, it changes the way you live. Your theology will inform your life 
your actions, your thoughts, your decisions. And each of us needs the words of John on this point because if we do not, we will continue to silently struggle with sin behind closed doors with no help. John's motivation behind these words is to call us to repentance, to help us walk in holiness. And that's my goal for you too. But notice he doesn't stop there either, but offers us these encouraging words. If anyone does sin. He writes these things so you may not sin, but if we do, and we, so we do often, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is our advocate. And this word advocate is the same word that we saw in the Gospel of John describing the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, our, our helper. And it, it describes the work of a defense attorney that goes before us to, to proclaim that we, we, he's, he's helping us on our behalf. The great Puritan author John Bunyan meditates on the nuances between Christ as our priest who pays the penalty for sin, cleanses us from all unrighteousness and gives us access to God. He meditates on that in relationship to Christ as our advocate. And here's what he says is the difference. Christ as priest goes before. Christ as advocate comes after. Christ as priest continually intercedes. Christ as advocate in case of great transgressions pleads. Christ as priest has need to act always, but Christ as advocate sometimes only. Christ as priest acts in times of peace, but Christ as advocate sometimes only. Christ, or, uh, in times of broils, turmoils, and sharp contentions. Wherefore, Christ as advocate is, as I may call him, a reserve. And his time is then to arise, to stand up and plead when we are clothed with some filthy sin that of late we have fallen into. And while Bunyan might be slicing the pie a little bit thin, it seems to me that the context warrants this. What pride and arrogance could be underneath the statement, I have not sinned? What sins could be hiding under that statement? How much fear does a person have about confessing their sins that they would say such a thing? And John Bunyan says, even in the darkest, even the most egregious sins we commit, we are forgiven because Christ represents us, defends us, and pays the penalty that we deserve. Look at verse 2. It says he is the propitiation for our sin, meaning he absorbs God's wrath for us. So the, the, me the, the mechanism of Christ as advocate comes from his work as our propitiation. He's the defense lawyer that's already done the time for you. He's the defense lawyer that's already paid the penalty for you. And that's how he can go before the jury and the judge and proclaim they're innocent because the debt's already paid. Christ's work as our advocate is all the more reason to run to God when we sin. We have no reason to fret, worry, or fear. Christ our advocate means that Christ is better than all life can give and all death can take. He is our treasure. He is our love. He is our life. He is our helper, and he is right now sitting at God's right hand, proclaiming that each sin is covered by his own blood. He is the one that proclaims for all to hear, God, your wrath was satisfied for this sin my child is committing. Jesus is our advocate, our high priest, who accomplishes salvation for us, so we can walk in the light. We can confess our sins without any fear, because he is faithful to keep cleansing you. Trust your advocate. Now before we close, let's take one more look at the passage as a whole. And I wonder if you caught the flow of each point. John's audience is facing a type of heresy that puffs up and doesn't acknowledge sin as sin. And we clearly saw all those negatives. We couldn't say that God is light with also claiming fellowship with God and walking in the darkness. We could not say God is light while also claiming we don't sin or have no sin. Imagine a church with theology like this. Imagine the pride, the self-righteousness, the rampant sin that would grow in this church. But notice the theological correction. It's not do better. It's not try harder. He preaches the gospel to them. Look at verse 7. 
He, the Son cleanses us from sin. Look at verse 9. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Look at verse 2. He's the propitiation for our sins. John's method of addressing false teaching and false thinking and false doctrine in this church is to preach the gospel. We, what we need is the truth of the gospel rehearsed over and over and over again in our own lives and in this pulpit every week because we're gospel amnesiacs. Now, this is something that we talk about in this church quite a bit. But before we close, I want to give five reasons why we should preach the gospel to ourselves. Five reasons why we should preach the gospel to ourselves. First, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves because it helps to free us from sin. It helps to free us from sin. In his book, A Gospel Primer, Milton Vincent advocates for the same thing, to preach the gospel to yourself, but he gives this reason. As long as I am stricken with the guilt of my sins, I will be captive to them and will keep recommitting the very sins about which I feel most guilty. The devil is very well aware of this fact. He knows that if he can keep me tormented by sin's guilt, he can dominate me with sin's power. However, the gospel slays sin at this root point and thereby nullifies sin's power over me. The forgiveness of God made known to me through the gospel liberates me from sin's power because it liberates me from its guilt. And preaching the gospel to myself and preaching this forgiveness to myself is a practical way of putting the gospel into operation as a nullifier of sin's power in my life. And I know all of us have been, with, been in that, where we're in this cycle where we're constantly sinning the same thing over and over and over again, and we feel guilty about it. And then we sin again, and we feel more guilty about it. And then we fear confessing it because it's gotten so bad. The solution is to rip out the root of self-guilt and self-condemnation by preaching the gospel to yourself. Second, preaching the gospel to yourself helps motivate us to obedience. When we consider the great glories of the gospel and what Christ has done for us, the commands of Scripture are a delight. The Psalms say that we delight in the law, that the law of the Lord is sweet like the drippings of honeycomb. And we can have that same attitude towards Scripture. When we consider the love of God and sending His Son to live a perfect life, die in our place, be buried, raised on the third day, ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father, that great cost motivates us to genuine obedience. Obedience is a response to gospel truths and is a heart overflowing in gratitude. Third, preaching the gospel to yourself helps foster humility. It helps to foster humility. While the new covenant focus is not in our sinfulness, it does show the vast cost it took. God himself, the second person of the Trinity, came to earth, assumed a human nature to restore us once again. Sin is that evil that it warrants God taking drastic measures to save us. Sin is that treacherous. Sin is that horrendous. Sin is that damaging. And when we meditate on the, the, the cost it took, when we consider our level of depravity, helplessness, need, and dependence on God for our salvation, it is no wonder that humility and thinking of yourself less often will be a natural consequence. So first, preaching the gospel to yourself helps free us from sin. It helps motivate us to obey. It helps foster humility. Fourth, it helps change our thinking. Helps change on thinking. When I meditate on the gospel myself and preach it to myself every day through scripture reading and prayer, I find myself to be a more tolerable person. I find myself to be a more gracious and kind husband, a more submissive church member to my elders, a more forgiving coworker, a more patient teacher, a more diligent employee, a better son to my parents, and more. The gospel helps reorient our minds to help us live in this world in a holy way. The gospel changes my thinking and worldview to be more inclined to forgive and show grace. What we spend our time meditating on is what we eventually become. And lastly, we are to preach the gospel to ourselves fifthly because it helps our assurance. It helps our assurance. There are some of you in this room 
that throughout this sermon have felt condemned and doubt that you are saved. But the more we meditate on the gospel, the more we realize that our faith is not in our faith, but in Christ. Our faith is not in how good we believe. Our faith is not in how good we respond, but in Christ. And the better we understand the gospel, the more sturdy the foundation is perceived. Notice I said that word perceived. We can't strengthen the cross work of Christ at all by our belief. But if we perceive it as strong, that helps us in assurance. For these reasons, I would argue that preaching the gospel to yourself is actually the high point, the pinnacle of the Christian spiritual disciplines. So as we close, the point of this sermon was quite simple. God is light. God is holy. God is good. And John gives us a grid to help us apply scripture rightly, to understand that no theological truth is divorced from application. We need each other. We need the church. We need theology centered on the gospel and the person and work of Christ. And every application of scripture is rooted in the deep truths of God. So let us reflect the light of the gospel in our church and in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we are in desperate need of your grace and kindness. Lord, help us to see our sinfulness and our need for your grace. Help us to see where we functionally deny the truths that we hold dear. Help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. Help us to find the strength and boldness to confess our sins and help us to trust our advocate all the more. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.